Good morning, everyone. I now call this remote meeting of the House Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Committee to order, and we will begin by taking the roll. Darrell Long. Present. Vice Chair Aikum. Present. Uh, Minority Lead Swazinski. Present. Uh, Representative Bierman. Present. Representative Bowe. Present. Representative Christensen. Representative Christensen. Representative Franson. Present. Representative Grunhagen. Present. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Hornstein. Present. Representative Igo. Present. Representative Lee. Lee, present. Representative Lippert. Present. Representative Liz Lagarde. <laughs> Representative Liz Lagarde. Representative Meckland. Present. Representative Munson. Representative Munson. Representative Stevenson. Representative Stevenson. We do have a quorum and we also have uh, minutes to approve from February 18th, 2021. Uh, Vice Chair Aikum, would you care to move the minutes? Yes, um, uh, yes, Chair, I would like to move the minutes. Our Vice Chair Aikum moves the minutes from February 18th, 2021. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendments are adopted. We have uh, three bills before us today, which have all been uh, posted to our website. And first is our bill from Representative Bierman on Task Force on Expanding Weatherization. Uh, Representative Bierman, please present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members, for your attention this morning to this briefing on a comprehensive approach to a weatherization assistance program for our state. Energy burden is the percentage of household income spent on home energy bills. The national average energy burden is roughly 3.5%. But some Minnesotans spend 20 to 30% of their income on energy. Minnesota utilizes a few programs to serve our most vulnerable residents with energy assistance. LIHEAP, the Healthy Air Program, Low Income SIP Program. These are three examples that bring relief to some Minnesotans. Current efforts year over year are varied and sometimes unfunded. Infusing energy cost supports to alleviate the financial burden only gets us through another year. We can see from other states' experience that developing a plan to achieve an enhanced federal weatherization program is an investment worth making. Home weatherization programs save money for residents, utilities, and ratepayers across the system and across the state. Authorized by the Department of Energy, the Weatherization Assistance Program serves households at or below 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. Priority is given to households with an elderly or a disabled member, children, or high energy consumption homes. Rather than just defraying the cost of heating and cooling expenses, weatherization helps with the improvements necessary to create real savings year, year over year. Repairs, retrofits, new insulation, installing a new door, weather stripping, attic air sealing, whatever the audit might reveal for energy savings can be done to secure long-term savings. Mr. Steve Cohn from Miltona, Minnesota in Douglas County, a disabled farmer received the full workup high energy fuel oil furnace, ductwork repair, insulation, four new windows, an attic air sealing, along with other energy savings, reduced his heating costs in half and electric electricity use by 30%. But we have glowing reports such as this one, we could do much more. As I said, the need is great. At our current rate of work, it will take 291 years to meet the need. Here are some numbers since 2005 to the present. In Sherburne County, 5,130 households qualify for assistance. 488 received it. 
McLeod County, 3,567 qualified, 413 received. In Douglas County, 4,089 qualified, 774 received assistance. 65% of the weatherization services were performed in rural Minnesota. As noted, benefits accrue across the state. Beyond the energy benefits, weatherization provides economic benefits with direct jobs, local contractors, and a ripple effect on local economies. We are not meeting the ever-increasing needs when program funding is not calibrated to meet demand and is restricted by biennial budget battles. Program created with sustained funding, program flexibility, and planning to meet workforce need requires advanced stakeholder discussions. This bill would create a task force to design recommendations with dedicated funding and match it to the capacities available in order to lead to a significant expansion of weatherization activity in our state. Today, we have with us a couple of the stakeholders who I would like to tell us more about their efforts across Minnesota. And Mr. Chair, uh, I would like to hear from uh, Mr. Bill Grant from uh, the Community Action Partnership first, please. Mr. Grant, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Long and committee members. My name is Bill Grant, and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Community Action Partnership. The partnership represents the 24 community action agencies that serve all 87 counties in Minnesota, with programs ranging from energy assistance and weatherization to Head Start and Meals on Wheels. We are supportive of the bill being briefed this morning to explore the expansion of weatherization services in Minnesota. Of the 24 community action agencies, 19 of them contract with the state to provide the federally funded weatherization assistance program. Particularly during the pandemic, weatherization has helped seniors and families struggling to pay utility bills, reduce the energy cost burden, and free up resources for other vital needs. The federal weatherization program began as a response to the oil price shocks of the mid 1970s. And I'm old enough to remember that. Since that time, Minnesota has weatherized over 10,000 homes, and since 2010, nearly 15 million square feet of residential space has been upgraded. Low-income homeowners and renters that qualify for the energy assistance program automatically qualify for weatherization services. However, at our current pace, as Representative Beerman noted, it will literally take decades to retrofit all eligible single-family and multifamily homes in Minnesota. Representative Beerman's bill seeks to explore what numerous other states have been doing for years, supplementing the federal program with other, with other fu uh, funding sources. In addition, the task force this bill creates would be asked to address the need for more flexibility in how funding can be spent. Current federal rules limit spending on repairs to homes that in turn prevents weatherization from being performed. For example, Many homes built in the middle of the last century used vermiculite for, ins for insulation. Vermiculite often contains asbestos, which is both hazardous and expensive to remove. In some parts of greater Minnesota, up to 40% of homes have been excluded from receiving weatherization due to problems like vermiculite. More flexible funding would allow program operators to address these issues and follow up with full weatherization services. Weather is, weatherizing homes is a good investment for more than just the energy savings. It improves the health of those living in weatherized homes. It helps seniors stay in their homes longer. It increases property values while improving the housing stock, and it contributes jobs to the local economies. A well-structured task force will examine alternative funding and program flexibility models already in use in other states and recommend to this body a path forward for accelerating the deployment of this needed program. I'd be happy to take questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Representative Bierman, would you like to introduce your next testifier? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Laura Milbrand from Prairie Five Community Action. Ms. Bill Milbrand, welcome to the committee. Thank you. 
Um, good morning, Chair Long, committee members. Um, thank you, Representative Bierman. That was a very, very good synopsis of the program. I appreciate that. And thank you, Bill, for your comments. <clears throat> I am Laura Milbrandt. I'm the Weatherization Director at Prairie 5 Community Action Council. We are located in Western Minnesota, Region 6W. We serve the counties of Big Stone, Chippewa, Lackaparle, Swift, and Yellow Medicine, um, probably some of the smaller counties in the state. I am also the co-chair of the Minnesota Weatherization Advisory Group, which is our service provider network in the state of Minnesota. And I also sit on the Department of Commerce's WAPPAC, which is the Weatherization um, Policy Advisory Council. So I'm very aware of the needs and the issues of weatherization, good and bad across the state. I've been working with Prairie 5 for many years, probably remember a lot of things Bill does. Um, and have seen a lot of changes in the weatherization program in that time. From a two page paper audit and putting plastic on windows to the technical scientific and computer oriented program we have now, which requires us to have highly trained and skilled staff that work the program. Because Prairie 5 serves a rural area, we're a small weatherization program. Um, in the whole scope of things, we're probably actually one of the smallest service providers in the network. However, since we've started keeping track of jobs, which was back in the early 90s, we have served 32 households with the weatherization program. Granted, it has changed over the years in how we serve them. Um, but weatherization is typically a one-time investment in the home to re reduce the energy burden, make the home safer, make it more comfortable for the household. And everyone probably knows someone who has benefited from the weatherization program over the years. Finding leverage funds is a great need in the state as like Bill stated, 40 to 50% across the, the state find that they have to defer 40 to 50% of the houses that we go to look at. And, and just a, a little background on that, we usually go out and do pre-audits to determine because there are so many things that can kick it out if we can actually do the audit. And that's where we come up with our percentages of, of deferrals. And this is due to the conditions in the house that need to be addressed before any weatherization work can be done in the home. These could include many of what Bill mentioned, vermiculite in the home, inaccessible crawl spaces, health and safety items that are beyond the scope of weatherization. For example, um, wiring problems that we can't address or plumbing issues that we can't address, failing foundations, um, to name a few. Weatherization believes in do no harm. So if what we're going to do as the weatherization work is going to create more issues for the house and the household, we have to defer those projects until we can find another source of funding to fix the non-weatherization issues. To be able to do the weatherization in these houses, then we need other sources of funding. The healthy air funds through the state are a very good example. Um, those allowed us to address the vermiculite in the home, get it all cleaned out, and then we went back in and we weatherized the home properly. Um, we also try to utilize other federal funds if they're possible, for example, deed small city funds, but those are not necessarily available everywhere in the state and not necessarily available at the time we need them. It would be very beneficial across the state to have a fund of some sort that could address some of the health and safety, leaking roof areas, um, minor work that would enable us to weatherize a home. It would allow us to work on the households that at this point we've had to defer, and this would open up a whole other pool of weatherization projects for us. The state of Minnesota's weatherization service providers are very proud of the weatherization service we provide in this state and we're always willing to work with the Department of Commerce, Commerce or other funders for improving the program, such as leveraging, um, allowing more flexibility in the program. We are mired down by DOE with a lot of rules. So when we can find funds that don't tie us to DOE, it, it's like we're in heaven. We're, we're able to do a lot more. Um, streamlining the program, we, we are mired down in paperwork, just as a, a reference, we went from a file probably, you know, about that thick 
about 20 pages to we counted it just recently 130 to 150 pages in our file so we are mired down in a lot of red tape and paperwork and trying to find funding for collaborations that might help to offset the deferrals or make our federal funds go farther i truly believe this task force would be able to assist moving forward options for funding or leveraging within the state of minnesota that would uh, really benefit the weatherization program in the state. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much, Ms. Milburn. Um, I, I, I do have a couple of questions to start. First, I just want to thank Representative Bierman for bringing this bill. This is such an important topic, and it's an issue that has been really stuck for so long. We haven't seen uh, federal funding, you know, increase to meet the need for many, many years, and um, the over 200 years to actually get covered all of those who are eligible uh, at the pace we're going is really startling. So the, my question is for Mr. Grant. I, I know that there are a number of other states who have done better than we have in terms of their ability to fund these programs. I, I recall speaking with a legislator from Vermont at a national conference who mentioned that they um, are matching essentially the state, the federal dollars that they're getting for weatherization. So they are doing um, quite a bit more in terms of uh, weatherizing their homes in a similarly cold climate. And I'm wondering if you could, could speak to uh, examples from other states that are, that are doing this well. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. Um, there are a number of other states. Actually, our neighbor just to the east, Wisconsin, is another state that is uh, supplementing uh, federal funding with state funding. Um, and in a number of cases, um, uh, those funds are... Uh, uh, contributions from uh, utility customers with a very small surcharge on utility bills um, uh, to uh, contribute toward uh, low-income programs like weatherization and energy assistance. Uh, uh, other states have found other sources of funds, uh, uh, non-general fund sources uh, that they're employing for these purposes. The, the, the real point here is that we'd like to find sources that don't require um, regular uh, appropriation cycles so that we have a stable source of funding um, that um, we can, that we know that we can rely on for the program going forward. Thank you, Mr. Grant, that's helpful. Uh, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that was kind of along the questioning that I had. And my question would be to the, the I forget your name, <laughs> from the Prairie Five. Ms. Milbrandt. Milbrandt, yes. Uh, Matt, Milbrandt, when you're doing the projects and obviously you contract with subcontractors to go out and do the weatherization, do they pay sales tax on the insulation or the materials that they use during the construction process? Yes. Ms. Milbrandt. Thank you. Um, we um, are a contract-based organization only, so we do not have a crew. So what we do is we bid the project out to them and they purchase the materials so they are paying the sales tax and, and all that. They're not getting an exemption from that. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for, and then back to Ms. Milbrandt. Um, you're doing a great job, by the way. Um, what percentage of the project, so how much in Prairie 5, what was your budget and what was your material cost of that budget? So um, what we're trying to get to is, is, you know, obviously if we're dealing with limited dollars, there's no reason why we're taking federal money that's coming to you or passing through the state and then paying sales tax on those materials to go back to the general fund. Like the first thing we should be doing is actually having those dollars actually build things, not pay sales tax. That's the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a rough idea just within your area or Mr. Grant or what that would mean uh, potentially to increase funding for this project? Ms. Milbrandt. I would say, you know, with DOE dollars, we get about 120,000 and we probably spend, um, I'd say about 80% of that, uh, 90%, yeah, 80% of that on the projects. And we usually divide materials and labor. They come out pretty close to 50-50. So I'd say with that DOE money, we're probably going at about you know $40,000 of materials. Mr. Grant, did you want to add in? Oh, well, 
only to say, Mr. Chairman and, and Representative Swodinski, that um, I, would, I would certainly think sales tax exemption would be one of the things that the task force could explore as a, as a possible um, funding source for, uh, among the other funding sources that they could explore. Representative Swodinski. I muted myself. <laughs> um, and to just Mr. Grant, um, you know, you had mentioned to do a surcharge, so it's essentially raise other people's rates uh, to fund this. Is that kind of your main concern when you say you want a, a non-general fund stipend, you want a, a direct tax on ratepayers to pay for this potentially? Mr. Grant. Mr. Chair and Representative Swodinski, um, I, I only raised it because this is what other states have done. Um, and, and is a model that is being employed in other states. I'm not suggesting that that's necessarily the direction that Minnesota would want to go, uh, but it is one of the things that I think a task force like this would look at only because it's it's the way it's being done in some other states. Representative. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Just, and then Bill, obviously, uh, Mr. Grant, um, just if you could maybe do a little work, it'd be interesting to see what the sales tax portion across the state you know, obviously we saw a snippet with Prairie 5, but any of these types of programs that are existing, what that total cost would be um, as far as amounts of dollars that if we, the state were to eliminate that, what that could potentially mean to more actual projects happening. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Swazinski. I don't see further questions, so thank you so much, Representative Bierman, and to our testifiers. Thank you. So our next uh, bill uh, will be Representative Lippert's bill dealing with solar energy siting. Uh, Representative Lippert, welcome and please present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, we've been talking regularly in committee about our state's climate goals, how we get there. We will need more renewable energy as we seek to meet these goals and we'll need more solar. Our climate goals will drive this and the economics, the affordability of solar will drive this too. This bill deals with solar and prime farmland. Uh, the prime farmland exclusion rule was created in the 1980s to address larger environmental impacts connected to coal and nuclear power plant construction. It's now being applied to solar, but solar isn't what the rule was designed to address. Rather than doing what a rule should do, solving conflict and creating clarity, it's doing the opposite. This rule is creating conflict and confusion in what should be a win-win situation. Solar development is good for rural communities. The tax payments allow local municipalities to invest more. Farmers are interested in lease payments to help them diversify their income streams. Development creates jobs and there's ongoing operations and maintenance wages for workers. And with a vegetation plan, the vegetation under the solar panels protects the soil, actually improving it during the lifetime of the lease. This bill then directs the Public Utilities Commission to amend this rule to allow the siting of solar on prime farmland if it meets the following conditions. It's placed on a sensitive groundwater area which improves water quality. There's a Bowser agreement for vegetation, forage, and pollinator plan, or there's a plan for continued agricultural uses like grazing or harvesting forage. At this time, I can turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you, Representative Lippert. I believe our uh, first testifier on the list is Mr. Adam Sikulski. Welcome to, the, welcome to the committee, Mr. Sikulski. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, members. My name is Adam Sikulski. I cover regulatory and legislative issues for EDF renewables. Uh, we are a large uh, wind, solar, and storage developer, owner, and operator uh, with about 30 years of experience across the United States. Uh, we've, we've developed about 16 gigawatts, 16,000 megawatts of renewables nationally, uh, own and operate um, about 11 gigawatts at this time, and have done about 1,200 megawatts of wind in Minnesota with a number of smaller scale commercial solar projects that we've built out for uh, a variety of customers here. First of all, EDF wants to thank Representative Lippert for working on this important issue. Utility scale solar is really growing quickly in Minnesota. Landowners are excited about being involved in solar projects and are enthusiastic about le leasing land for our projects. Utilities are asking for bids. Uh, energy consumers ranging from residential people like on my block, all the way up to large commercial and industrial firms 
are asking more and more for carbon-free uh, solar energy. Um, they like the fixed price, they like affordability, and they like that solar is clean. We're at a point in Minnesota where we need to address solar development on prime farmlands. Like Representative Lippert said, uh, in order for our state to meet our utility demands, as well as our state goals to significantly reduce carbon emissions in our state. Um, EDF strongly supports Representative Lippert's bill. We look forward to working with stakeholders to ensure that uh, this bill uh, both enhances solar development and uh, preserves and maintains uh, our important environmental values we hold on agricultural lands. Um, I think I don't need to go back through what Representative Lippert already said, but the bill provides the guidance we think that the Utilities Commission needs to revise this 40-year-old prime farmland rule, a rule that was really never envisioned um, solar energy at the utility scale being developed, but was really focused, as I looked at the record uh, last night, on large central station coal-fired power plants um, and the needs and requirements that they had at the time and how the state wanted to manage those needs. Clearly, we've gone beyond those types of facilities and are looking at an entirely different type of development with utility scale solar. Um, as I wrap up, I, I wanna encourage you to think legislators about solar in the same way you might think about conservation reserve program and other types of agricultural land conservation programs. Just like CRP, solar farms lease land from willing landowners, often farmers, um, those farmer landowners want solar to be developed. That land will support solar, but also have a lot of locally appropriate vegetation planted um, to enhance local soil quality, local water quality, and wildlife habitat. With a solar facility, the solar gets the same or greater benefit that a CRP uh, easement would have, along with the, demand, the, the, the strongly demanded uh, carbon-free electricity uh, product that people want as well as new local tax revenues. All of this is privately funded, not government funded. At the end of the solar project's life, you've got land that can be returned without damage to the landowner to continue row cropping, grazing, or whatever other use that the private property owner wants to employ. EDF uh, Renewables encourages your support of this bill. Uh, and we look forward to uh, working with the author and other interested parties to ensure this bill accommodates solar um, and uh, improves Minnesota agriculture and uh, in our environment. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sikorsky. Next, we will be hearing from Peter Muse. Welcome back to the committee, Ms. Muse. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity here. Uh, my name's uh, Peter Mavis. Uh, I'm the Western Regional Policy Manager for Clean Grid Alliance. <clears throat> CGA is a nonprofit organization based in St. Paul. Um, we represent uh, the large utility scale wind and solar developers such as EDF, uh, which uh, Mr. Sikolsky works with. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we work across uh, a nine state footprint across the upper Midwest. In addition to state policy and regulatory work, uh, we actively engage with MISO on a variety of issues, including transmission planning, cost allocation, and grid in interconnection. Um, I think uh, Mr. Sikolsky covered the issue pretty well. I appreciate uh, Representative Lippert and, and Chairman Long um, for bringing this issue forward. I would just add that, um, you know, this, this rule that we have in place is very unique to Minnesota and, and no other states have something similar to this. Um, when we're thinking about developing solar um, and we're developing it on prime farmland, this is, this land issue um, you know, is an, an important subject that we need to, to talk about. When we're thinking about utilities and the MISO queue and how much solar is coming down, I think it's important that we make a determination whether um, the state of Minnesota is comfortable uh, with moving forward with developing solar on prime farmland. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mavis. Uh, next, we will hear from David Schaefer. Welcome back to the committee, Mr. Schaefer. Thank you for having me. Uh, Chair Long and members of the committee, I'm David Schaefer, Executive Director of the Minnesota Solar Energy Industries Association. Uh, we'd wanna thank everyone for considering this bill here today, and we specifically would like to thank Representative Lippert for bringing the bill forward. This bill's language and the need of it stems from a PUC rule that precludes utility scale solar on prime farmland, unless the developer can prove there are no available non-prime land sites where the solar could be developed. This regulatory burden is overly onerous on developers 
non-prime farm might, may exist anywhere near the developer site. It may not be adjacent to available transmission lines or really be anywhere near where the developer had previously secured the land. Furthermore, in general, we believe that this rule is not necessary given current energy needs. To get our arms around the size and scope of this issue, if all the solar we are expecting to need as a state were to be located on prime farmland, then somewhere between 0.02% and 0.04% of the prime farmland would be temporarily taken out of use. The current PUC rule also mischaracterizes the impact of solar on the land. Most solar installations are on leased land. They are done using minimally invasive piling techniques like think, think of like a deeper fence post, for instance. And more and more common is the use of pollinator habitat or other nitrogen fixing native ground cover is a cost effective way to reduce maintenance costs like mowing. New trends are evolving as well. Pairing solar with sheep grazing or honey production is a growing industry that marries traditional agricultural uses with energy production. Solar installations are designed to be temporary in nature, beneficial to the farmland while they are present, and they're increasingly tied to agriculture directly. This bill finds a middle ground between the PUC's current farmland exclusion rule and the evolving marketplace of solar plus agriculture. Mencia supports the basic premise of preserving prime farmland as much as we can, but solar should never, never be viewed as a burden on farmland. But this is especially true when developers can illustrate that their projects will be beneficial to the farmland or protects local sensitive groundwater areas. Our industry supports the opening of unavailable land like closed landfills or CRP land and to create incentives to move solar development towards rooftop or, or buffer lands. We support using non-prime farm land when possible. But the reality is that some solar is going to be needed to be sited on prime farmland if our state's going to meet the proposed carbon-free legisla legislation goals or utility goals that, as they've been proposed. Uh, and frankly, just to even meet the current plans that the utilities have. For example, in their most recent integrated resource plan, Excel Energy is projecting a need for three gigawatts of solar by 2030. That's approximately 30,000 acres of solar. Some of that solar is going to need to be on farmland. And this outdated PUC rule will pose a burden to many of those utility scale projects as they seek approval. This bill recognizes that to meet the energy needs of Minnesota and the rapidly growing renewable energy market, some farmland will need to be used for solar. And it also recognizes that solar is not antithetical to farmland or agriculture. Solar can and will be part of Minnesota's agricultural mix. And this bill allows that to happen with a reasoned approach. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank you all again for hearing our testimony and thank Representative Lippert for bringing this bill forward. I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. We did have uh, one uh, individual sign up for public testimony. Uh, Mr. Ralph Kaler, if you could present your testimony now. Thank you. I'm Ralph Kaler from St. Charles, Minnesota. I think with a rule like this, it's important to peer from the people who are affected. I'm a century owned family farmer. We just converted our farm to our son and his family. So we have generations five and six on our family farm. The additional benefit is we're also the owners of a solar developing company. My oldest son is our CEO. We've developed over 200 megawatts of solar and we're a Minnesota based company. I think it's important that you hear from farmers and a rural resident on this issue. Solar is not taking prime ag land out of production. Rather, we're creating a new crop, it's electricity. I think that's an important key. For the most part, the crops that will be replaced by, the, by electricity are corn and soybeans. There's some interesting facts behind this. If, if you look, Minnesota exports about 50% of our corn and soybean production. We cannot use it all in the state. And can contrast that with all of the electricity produced off of this Minnesota ground would basically be used within Minnesota or within the close surrounding area. The change in this bill is going to be good for our farmers and our rural economies. We replace imported fossil fuel. Our profit on an acre of corn and soybeans ranges from losing 50 bucks an acre to making $300 an acre in a good year. It's volatile. For the, those that have ground that's available for solar, you're looking at $800 per year with a 20 to 35 year contract. It provides consistent income. It will allow farmers to stay on the land by putting part of their land into solar. 
that income is good for our rural economies. It's where we have, we can, it's put where we have available land and there's less competition for land and fewer people. It's a way for our rural economies to gain some of the advantages of solar that tend to be a metro benefit. We can bring our economies together. I did provide a, a uh, land, it's called Minnesota Farmland and Solar by the Numbers, put together by the search team and Fritz Ebinger. It's a great program that outlines the land use and facts and the available land are powerful tools. We have 25 million acres of farmland in Minnesota. 17 million acres are in production. We lose about 100,000 acres of farmland per year to urban sprawl. We have 1 million acres of farmland in Minnesota in CRP and conservation, paying farmers not to produce on them. If we get to our goal of 10% solar energy by 2030, that will take approximately 10 gigawatts. That is only 100,000 acres of farmland. It will not impact availability of food, of fuel, or the farming economy. The rest of our farm economy will continue on as usual. So in recapping the benefits of changing this rule, solar will reduce the urban rural divide. It provides some additional income for our rural communities. Our rural senators and representatives should be promoting this advantage extensively. Solar will rest the land for 20 to 35 years like a conservation program at no cost to the public. Rather, the farmer gets paid to do that. And when the solar field ends, that land is immediately available to go to traditional use. Again, it's a good deal for farmers, landowners in rural Minnesota and urban wet residents. It can help bring us together. As uh, one old farmer told me a long time ago, he said, you know, I'm all for progress. It's just change that I don't like. I think as we think about that, that may be part of what we're dealing with with this. It's good for landowners, rural economy, and the public in general. It's 100% Minnesota used, 100% Minnesota produced. I just don't understand if you aren't supporting this change, I have to ask, who are you representing? Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions from a farmer or solar developer perspective. Thank you, Mr. Kaler. Uh, we do have two members uh, with hands up, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and just my question is, I've got a fair amount, this is uh, to, the, to the author of the bill. How do you define prime farmland? Representative Libert. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Swinsinski. Um, there may be others on this um, others on this call that can define it better than I can. I mean, I think one of the realities is that um, the way prime farmland is defined, much of um, Southwest Minnesota, um, is that most of it is prime farmland. And so uh, that pretty much precludes solar from being developed um, um, in many places in Southwest Minnesota, but there may be others on the call that can define prime farmland, Mr. Chair. Would others like to speak to this? Mr. Mr. Sikolsky? Sure, um, Rep Chairman Long, Representative Sawizinski, um, prime farmland is defined in Minnesota based on the soil types that are present. Uh, certain soil types are considered better than others uh, for row crop production. Uh, things like uh, uh, you know dry soils, soils that are not uh, full of clay, etc., are considered prime. Other soil soil types uh, with with less productive characteristics are considered quote unquote non prime. Um, without uh, not being an agriculture or uh, or an agronomist, I don't want to go too much deeper than that. Um, but those are the definitions, and they're in, in, in uh, uh, as defined by the state. Representative Bozinski. Yeah, Mr. Chair, there was a group, uh, I think it was Department of Ag and others uh, a few months ago were working on developing this. They were working with ag groups to try to define prime farmland. What was the product of that work? Representative Lippert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there was a study produced um, as a product of that work, I believe, and this uh, the, 
language in this legislation uh, reflects the recommendations. It looks like Mr. Elop has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out that the rule itself that we're talking about um, defines prime farmland as a federal definition, um, not, not a state definition. And I, I, I've read the federal definition. It is highly, highly technical in terms of many characteristics of soils, um, but it is a federal definition. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Yula. You know, I think this argument I mean, I, I, I will admit I, I probably don't agree with Representative Lippert that this bill is the right direction. I actually think we should be going the opposite direction and really defining what we deem as not. I mean, believe it or not, I think we have 16 million acres in the state of Minnesota of prime fam farmland, and we have about 12 million acres of non-prime farmland throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, I believe, I think currently we have over 500,000 acres of irrigated land in the state of Minnesota. And we, the, one of the testifiers admitted that they're estimating that we could have up to 100,000 acres uh, of, of land put into solar production. And, you know, of that irrigated farmland, which is not prime because it's by nature sandy, it affects groundwater. Uh, of that 500,000 acres, I think we use about 81 billion gallons of groundwater. Now it was said that, oh, well, this will help us protect groundwater by planting, you know, a couple of grasses underneath this stuff. If you want to actually save groundwater, Mr. Kaler and Mr. Solgiski should be supporting only putting solar on irrigated land. Because if your goal is to truly protect it, if you could take a fifth of land out of irrigated, which is necessary for production, and not take up good quality prime farmland, you would actually do something. Uh, I had many conversations with your predecessor, Representative Long, uh, Representative Wagenius, and she was probably a woman that I would say is absolutely passionate about protecting groundwater. And even she, I think, was getting the idea that, you know what, you could use this as a tool to actually protect groundwater and put it around sandy soils, uh, I know I know there's a large development going up by Royalton that I think makes a lot of sense because guess what that land is sand when you pump the water out of the ground it goes right back in and if you take it out of production you would actually do something good for the environment you'd protect the metropolitan water sources you would do a lot of different things and this is going in the absolutely wrong direction by saying that we should actually be protecting these things because I, I believe that crop production in many ways is a lot like tube of toothpaste, right? When you would get to the end of it and you're trying to get that last little bit out of it, you know, we've got millions of people dying of famine throughout the world. And while they do not necessarily eat field corn, all food is food. And the idea that you're going to take something that would maybe average prime farmland, 250 bushels an acre corn, take it out of production, that corn will have to get grown someplace. That corn's either going to be cut down rainforest down in the Amazon, or it's going to be pressure, putting more pressure on the irrigated land, that sandy soil that's pumping groundwater out of the ground to irrigate it. So I appreciate the idea of this, but it's quite frankly, completely the opposite direction that we should be going. Um, I, I, I'm guessing, I don't know where the departments stand on this bill, but I mean, I was reading articles in California that they're, that environmentalists are getting upset that they're using desert for solar. And I think we owe it to the globe, we owe it to the United States, not to be taking out of production the best in the grass. I mean, if I have one complaint in Southwest Minnesota is when people do put CRP in, that they're actually not putting it on hilly fields. They're putting it on the flat stuff, they're putting it on anything. I mean, uh, I'm, it, it's, it, it'll put, this does not help get people on the land. This does not help young farmers get into to production by taking thousands and thousands and thousands out of good quality land out of production. Sorry. Looks like uh, Mr. Kaler wanted to chime in. Sure. Um, th okay. Thank well, you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'll just uh, thank Representative Smudzinski for those comments and, and point out that, um, you know, the first addressed in the bill is, you know, sensitive groundwater areas. 
as as one of the one of the qualifications for for siding. But I'll also turn things to uh, Ralph Kaler as well. Mr. Kaler. Yeah, so since I was mentioned on there, I'd say Representative Swadinsky, I think you're using the wrong information for the wrong purpose. Um, most of my focus is on this, is keeping the flexibility to farmers to produce the crops that they want to produce. To limit government in there to allow us to do what's right for the land, but still allow us the freedom of choice. By having this oversight and limiting where we can put solar, you're limiting an income source for farmers. The places where we can go with solar is limited based upon where the electric lines are in the substation. Using your, your uh, logic that you had there, it would be like building cities way up in the northern Minnesota where there aren't the jobs and where the access isn't. We're losing, we will lose in the next year, 10 years, 10 times the amount of land to urban sprawl that we will to solar. Where we're putting up solar is where there isn't other competition for the ground for the most part. Around the cities for big solar fields, around the metro area, that land is too expensive and the competition for it is too large. As a rural representative, our areas are being decimated by loss of people, loss of jobs, and lack of opportunity. Thank you, Mr. As a rural representative, I cannot understand why you wouldn't support having the available at opportunity for your constituents. Uh, looks like Representative Grunhagen has his hand up. Oh, oh yeah, right. thank you. Yeah, thank Sorry, you. Rep I thought Representative Swazinski was done, but he, he put his hand back oh. up. Representative Swazinski, and then we'll go to Representative Grunhagen. Mr. Mr. Chair, I just think, you know, Representative Keeler, this bill is not a community solar garden bill, um, which I think that's kind of your work, and I think that's the when you talk about kind of you're competing against housing to build community solar. I mean, this is industrial solar. This is hundreds of thousands of acres uh, that will be taken out of production someplace in Minnesota. And I think that's a real conversation we can have and saying, where is that someplace? Is it in our best ground? Is it in our medium ground? Or is it in our worst ground? And I don't think anyone would argue that if you have a choice, which we do, we have a choice today to set policy to say, where is that going to be? And I'm just saying it ought to be in the least productive, the most energy consuming when it comes to groundwater areas in the state. And I think most people with common sense would agree with that position rather than on the best. Representative Grunhagen. Did you call on me, Mr. Chair? I sure did. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, uh, uh, you know, some of the concerns were brought up by Representative uh, Swadinsky. I was raised on a farm and I'm in a rural community. And, uh, you know, the, um, the idea of taking prime farmland and taking it out of production, I know I've talked to my county commissioners, most of whom are farmers in my two counties I represent, they support this uh, current uh, status of uh, not using prime farmland. I understand the income side of it. I've been a big supporter of Section 179, also uh, credits on the uh, bonding issue for uh, building schools for farmers, and we want income. But this is simply a tax subsidy uh, uh, for farmers. And uh, it also, you know, it doesn't, solar doesn't provide base load electricity. And we've seen the disasters in California and Texas on this alternative energy. And we've had testimony with the rare earth elements and the uh, pollution potential uh, from these solar panels. Also, it's unreliable and it's ultimately expensive. So I think it's a poor trade to go from uh, prime farmland to produce food to uh, uh, to solar gardens. And again, we don't have the money set aside to clean all these solar gardens up. In fact, we had testimony in, in the past here in this committee, well, the co-ops will clean them up and spend millions of dollars, but they won't pass those costs on to the rate payers. Well, if you swallow that one, I got a bridge in London to sell you real cheap. I mean, it's just 
not reliable. I've stood on the house floor and said, I'll support solar and wind when it provides base load electricity. We don't have the technology and when it brings down the cost of electricity. And I understand the financial incentive, but I can't support this, even though I'm a rural legislator raised on a farm that wants farmers to do well. Uh, so if anybody wants to respond to that, feel free. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I can uh, make a quick response. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Gerhagen. I'll, I'll respond, some, uh, respond to one part of it and let uh, some others respond to questions about re reliability. I, I think it's important to note that in the same way that um, you know, it makes sense to put gas stations next to four-lane highways, um, it makes sense to put uh, solar, utility-scale solar, around substations. It doesn't make sense to put gas stations um, you know, where they're not connected to any sort of transportation infrastructure, and the same is true with uh, utility scale solar. So uh, with that, we start seeing kind of the focused nature of what, what this development um, you know, will be looking like. And I think that's important for this conversation. And, and I'll um, let Mr. Sikulski uh, respond as well. Mr. Sikulski. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that um, the Chairman Long, uh, Representative Lippert um, and others, want to make sure I responded on the um, uh, Representative Grunhagen's uh, comment that there's no money to clean up uh, or decommission a solar facility. Um, in Minnesota, if you build a wind plant or a solar plant, the Public Utilities Commission requires uh, the applicant and the, the company with the permit to set aside decommissioning funds, um, update those funds, uh, add to them, subtract from them, whatever it may be, uh, every five years, as well as update decommissioning plans every five years to ensure that there's sufficient money set aside in the event that the person or the company that owns the solar facility uh, goes bankrupt or is uh, somehow not able financially to foot the bill for decommissioning. So those, th those funds are set aside. Uh, currently, the, the PUC's directive is to uh, ensure that counties are uh, where you are building these facilities are the uh, financial beneficiaries of that financial assurance product. Um, I'm currently negotiating uh, one of those for one of our wind farms. Um, and so there's absolutely sufficient uh, funds set aside in the case that a developer owner operator goes out of business and is unable to, uh, uh, to decommission a project. The other thing I'll just mention is Wind and solar, as we've seen at MISO, uh, we've seen our, our Minnesota utilities have done a fantastic job of man maintaining uh, and managing and integrating wind and solar, the variable nature of those, uh, into the electric grid. Uh, they've also been able to work with the electric grid and manage those daily diurnal ups and downs of demand and ensuring that's a reliable product uh, for us here in the upper Midwest. We've seen incredible innovation on that front. Um, from MISO, from grid operators, from the local utilities uh, that we all uh, sometimes choose to, to give a hard time. It's a tough job, and they've done incredible work in that area. Wind and solar can be a very reliable product, along with the other kind of orchestra of other generation that we have and keeping that balanced uh, on a daily basis. Thank you, Mr. Skull. Representative Gunhagen, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I would just say I met with solar manufacturers a couple of weeks ago on a, on a Zoom call, and I asked them about storage and backup uh, battery storage on these alternatives to maintain base load electricity. They said at a minimum, it's five years away or more. OK, so we're setting ourselves up for a similar situation to California and Texas with a, with uh, rolling blackouts. Uh, at a time when it's most needed in our state. This is not a good trade-off. Please look at the science and the facts when promoting this rather than huge government mandate, subsidized mandates, which sometimes blind people and drive them towards promoting this stuff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Uh, I have uh, one quick question and then we're gonna have to move on uh, to the next bill. So uh, I, I think I just wanted to refocus a little bit on what I understand this bill to do. Our, our current law uh, on prime farmland is not a prohibition on building on prime farmland. It's a preference for looking at other areas. And my understanding from the testimony that we've heard is that in some counties and areas of the state, there really are no alternatives to prime farmland. So the question is, do you build in Southern Minnesota or don't you? And what we're looking to do, what you're looking to do, Representative Lippert with this bill, uh, would also still allow folks to go through the process that we have now where they could 
if they so chose, um, go, you know, pr provide the alternatives analysis to whether they want to build on prime farmland or not. But it would also give some predictability for farmers who, for developers who are doing things that are win-wins for agriculture, like having um, pollinator ground, like doing joint grazing, like we've, we've heard from, uh, from Mr. Schaefer, that they, if there was a situation where they were doing something that was uh, uh, affirmatively beneficial to the local agricultural economy, that this would be, um, they would not have to go through this alternatives analysis. Am I getting that right, Representative Lippert? Yes, Mr. Chair, that's that's correct. You know, we we want we need a rule that's really um, designed with solar in mind, uh, rather than using a rule that was designed for something else. And and this, uh, we believe, can create the sort of clarity um, that we need and um, minimize conflict as we go forward. And I, and I'm happy to com uh, have some conversation with Representative Swazinski about um, irrigated land and its role in in this list too. Um, so I think this rule is a is a good step forward and uh, provide some clarity for us. Uh, Representative Swazinski, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next bill. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I would, uh, Mr. Lippert, I, or Representative Lippert, I'd be glad to work with you. You know, obviously you got a, a couple ideas in this area. Um, you know, I think if you um, would just talk about protecting water and having that as a real uh, provision to be able to use it and get rid of the other stuff. I mean, I really believe, you know, your second, your first uh, point is probably good with the the water, but the the second one talking about grazing or I mean that's that's setting an awfully low bar uh, to allow this to move forward. Um, obviously, we come from a little bit different directions on this, but I'd be more than happy to work with you, Representative. Representative Lippert, did you have a closing comment? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we may not be in agreement on those last two pieces, but um, I do think uh, you know the, this is. Uh, these recommendations are coming out of other report uh, that Department of Ag and Commerce put together. I think it's a good direction for us, um, and there's uh, certainly more conversations to be had. But we need to we need to find a balance so we can we can develop solar and do it in a way that makes sense. So we can meet our goals, and it's good for rural communities and farmers too. Thank you, Representative Lippert. Uh, with that, we will be moving on to our final bill for this morning, um, and that is Representative Stevenson's bill. Uh, Representative Stevenson, would you like to present your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this bill uh, relates to some modernization and some uh, reform of uh, some permitting provisions in uh, our law. You know, uh, I think uh, the best way to kind of frame this up is similar to what uh, I've said with regard to some other bills that a lot of our existing uh, law uh, around uh, ed energy regulation uh, predates the energy revolution that is undergoing that we're undergoing right now, uh, and was written for a time when we had uh, different uh, energy resources that were being constructed by different actors. Uh, and so we're just trying to to update a few things uh, in order to um, uh, accommodate sort of new realities on the ground. Uh, the the other thing that I would say as a frame on the outside before I kind of briefly describe what we're doing here is that this bill is very much a work in progress. And uh, I'm really thankful for the chair for devoting some committee time today to have a chance to have this uh, discussion. Looking forward to the input from committee members and stakeholders. And I'm going to continue to work on uh, this language. I don't think it's a finished project or product just yet. Uh, but I think it's a good time for us to, to, to have this conversation as a committee and, and, and the public. So the, 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 the bill does a couple different things. The first piece uh, relates to uh, a certificate of need. Uh, and, you know, when we have uh, utility, I'm sorry, when we have energy projects that are being built by uh, our utilities, a certificate of need is a really important step in that process. Utilities, of course, uh, have a monopoly. Uh, they have rate recovery. And so it's important that we have a regulatory check to make sure that the utility isn't uh, gold plating uh, what they're doing, uh, that we're, we're, what we're doing is really necessary and in the public interest. Uh, but it maybe doesn't make sense to have a certificate of need when uh, you have a project that's being built uh, by uh, uh, an independent power producer or developer 
um, that doesn't have monopoly, that doesn't have rate recovery. Uh, and so what we're looking at trying to do in the first section of the bill is, is get at that dynamic. Now, this is an area where some of the language still needs to be uh, uh, worked on to better get at that distinction. But, you know, the, whether we need a certificate of need, uh, if you'll pardon the, the double use of the word there, uh, it, when we have uh, an independent power producer building a project, when you have really the market forces that are there uh, to make sure that they're, they're um, uh, doing a project that makes economic sense, I think is an important question. And, and I'm persuaded that it doesn't, right? So like if a developer tries to build a wind uh, farm and there's no one to buy it, they can't just turn to the rate payer and, and ask them to pay for it. They, then they're in, they're in real trouble, right? So that's different than a utility uh, situation. Uh, the second piece of the puzzle relates uh, to tie lines uh, on uh, uh, for new uh, developments. As we've talked in this committee uh, before, the new energy projects that are being built require a lot of uh, transmission uh, to be built out. Um, and uh, right now, uh, you have a process where you have to go through a, a formal review at the uh, PUC uh, under certain circumstances, uh, but there are a few exceptions, including if the, 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 the tie line is less than five miles long. Uh, the, the bill language that you have in front of you uh, looks more to whether there's um, uh, 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 permission or uh, easements if the landowners are on board rather than the length of the tie line uh, as being the standard. Um, the last piece uh, that I'll highlight is uh, relating to wind turbine uh, lighting systems. This was actually a bill that Representative Swazinski uh, had uh, last biennium and then uh, I worked with um, uh, stakeholders to develop some language last session included it in last year's version of Clean Energy First. Uh, did not include it in Clean Energy First this year, but, but still think it's a good idea, uh, and uh, so included it in this bill. Uh, the idea essentially is that there's technology now available that the lights, the blinking lights on the top of turbines only need to activate when there's, uh, you know, a reason for them to be activated, that is, like, aircraft in the vicinity. Uh, otherwise, they don't, they don't need to, we don't need to have the unnecessary light uh, pollution out in, in greater Minnesota. Uh, so this is a kind of uh, updating of the language to accommodate that. So that's kind of a, a thumbnail sketch of this bill. I know it's a little technical, but uh, I think it's an important change that would make the, the landscape a little bit easier for our, our uh, developers and utilities to navigate uh, and also help uh, consumers. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. Would you care to introduce your testifiers? Absolutely. My first testifier is uh, Peter Mavis from Clean Grid Alliance. Mr. Mavis, uh, welcome back. Representative Long, uh, thanks for the opportunity once again. Uh, Peter Mavis, Regional Policy Manager uh, for Clean Grid Alliance. Um, I think uh, Representative Stevenson covered, uh, did a nice job of kind of um, covering the bill. Um, just a few additional comments. Um, you know, as, as Representative Stevenson said, Minnesota, you know, is currently operating under a 40-year-old regulatory regime that was, you know, designed exclusively for the oversight of, of the state's investor-owned utilities. <clears throat> you know, this regime was not designed for the massive influx of renewable energy projects and the advent of independent power producers. You know, IPPs operate uh, in a very competitive market across the region and country. State laws and regulatory processes can have a significant impact on the cost and timing to develop projects. You know, while Minnesota has been a national leader in deploying renewable energy, um, Clean Grid Alliance and our member companies believe that there are opportunities to reform the state's siting and permitting processes to more reflect the changing landscape and ensure Minnesota stays competitive with surrounding states. Um, Mr. Chairman, th this bill is a culmination of months of work and collaboration with, uh, with the renewable energy industry. You know, we've been working with the Public Utilities Commission, we've been working with other state agencies, legislators, and uh, our environmental organization friends. Reforming and streamlining the regulatory processes, it's not an easy task. Um, it's important the state and the commission continue to retain the necessary tools to balance environmental concerns, socioeconomic considerations, and ensuring projects are truly in the public interest. Um, Clean Grid Alliance believes that this bill um, strikes that balance. Um, I would say the theme of this bill is to recognize that independent power producers are very different than investor-owned utilities. 
you know, as Representative Stevenson said, <clears throat> IPPs do not have captive ratepayers, nor do they utilize them in a domain. And there's, you know, there's a great amount of financial risk in developing projects. You know, developers need willing landowners, they need financial viable interconnection agreements with MISO, and they need willing off takers, which could be utilities, and we're seeing an ever increasing demand from CNI customers. Uh, lastly, you know, renewable energy projects uh, bring millions of dollars <clears throat> in sustainable tax revenue to local communities. Uh, to date, the renewable energy industry in Minnesota has provided over $100 million in local tax revenue since the inception of the production tax. Um, this uh, concludes my testimony, and I'm happy to answer any technical questions. Um, I also have uh, um, Mr. Sikolsky with me, too, to, to help uh, walk through some items if necessary. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mavis. Uh, Mr. Sokolsky, did you want to comment? At this point, I stand behind uh, Mr. Mavis's uh, testimony, and I'm here to uh, help answer any more uh, direct questions if there, are, if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sokolsky. Representative Stevenson, would you like to introduce your next testifier? Well, uh, Mr. Chair, my next testifier needs no introduction. It's the one and only Mike Bull. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mr. Bull, welcome thank you, back Mr. to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Mike Bull, the policy director at the Center for Energy and Environment. I'm also the vice chair of the board of the directors for the Clean, Clean Grid Alliance. Uh, Clean Grid is a very unique organization. It's actually a coalition made up of clean energy nonprofits in the Med Midwest like CEE, Fresh Energy, and a number of others, along with renewable energy developers like Apex, Avon Grid, Next Era, and others working together to advance renewable energy in the Midwest. As uh, uh, Representative Stevenson and Peter Mavis said this House file would update and modernize some pretty old provisions in our statutes that do act as a barrier to renewable development in, in uh, Minnesota. The certificate of need uh, requirement, as Representative Stevenson said, is a ratepayer protection statute, ensuring that utilities aren't building infrastructure that isn't needed to serve customers. Since these renewable developers are independent power producers, they don't have captive uh, ratepayers to pass costs onto, uh, so no ratepayers to protect. Eliminating the certificate of need for at least these projects uh, does make sense. Combining the gen site uh, and Gentai permitting for solar projects places these under the responsibility of the Public Utilities Commission and eliminates the need for a local unit to provide a conditional use permit, removing that extra step. Uh, with regard to Gentai for wind project, Bill is just trying to move the process away from requiring a second route for those lines. That just adds cost, complexity, and confusion to the process, which is another barrier to getting projects built. And finally, I testified last session that turbine lighting provisions uh, uh, in this bill uh, seem to be a, a common sense response to some uh, real uh, landowner concerns, and I'm glad to see them back this session. And I'll just close by saying, enacting these common sense provisions, Minnesota can uh, continue to lead the nation in the clean energy transition, protecting landowners and ratepayers and others while encouraging the local economic development that comes with developing these utility scale wind and solar projects in our state. And I encourage a yes vote when it comes to it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Bull. We have two folks who have signed up for uh, public testimony. First is Ms. Stacy Fuji. Ms. Fuji, welcome back to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Stacy Fuji, and I represent Great River Energy. Great River Energy is a generation and transmission cooperative. We are owned by our 28 distribution cooperatives. I'd like to draw the committee's attention to lines 5.18 to 5.22 of this bill. This adds a new type of project, transmission lines greater than 200 kV, where the project proposer has obtained all of its easements to the list of projects that can go through the alternative or expedited siting and routing review process. Great River Energy finds this language to be problematic. The current law limits by size and or length the kinds of transmission projects that can go through the alternative or expedited review process. 100 to 200 kV, greater than 200 kV, but less than five miles, et cetera. In contrast, the new language sets only one limitation, obtaining easements as the limitation provided. So this is simply a floor. Arguably, we could be talking about a 500 kV line that is going 200 miles. And as you think about a project of that size and scope, you need to know the difference between a regular 
routing and siting process, and the expedited process. So under the regular process, a project proposer must, as Mr. Bull said, have a pre-application meeting with impacted local government units, whereas no such meetings are necessary under the alternative review process. Under the regular review process, a proposer needs to submit at least two route options and only one under the alternative review process. And the list goes on. But the last and most important thing is that under the alternative review process, a final permit is issued six months from the first application versus one year under the regular process. And if you go back to my original 500 KV line that's going 200 miles, think about whether the cities, the townships, the communities that you represent can fully have and fully participate in this process on a, on a project of a potential size and scale of that in a six month time period. So these laws were enacted to provide citizens ample opportunity and time to let their voices be heard within the process. Great River Energy is a utility. We have an obligation to serve. And so when we think about transmission development and siting and routing, we think of both short-term and long-term impacts. Make no mistake, transmission development requires a large financial investment. But that infrastructure is going to remain in the community for a long period of time. We understand the concerns and frustrations of the developers congestion issues, and not building quickly. Great River Energy and frankly, all utilities know that as generation retires, we are going to need to build more transmission. We will, but from a public perspective, a public policy perspective, we need to balance the need for speed and the need to, to have communities, not just the community members that have granted easements, all the whole communities have meaningful and full participation in the siting and routing process. Because if we don't get it right, if we don't listen to the members of the community, then the next time we need to site generation or excuse me, transmission or invest in upgrades, it will be that much harder. So in closing, Mr. Chair members, I did have a chance to touch base briefly with Representative Stevenson. So he did know that uh, where Great River Energy's concerns are coming from. And we do hope to continue to have these discussions with Representative Stevenson and the proponents to potentially uh, find some kind of a compromise on this on this, this provision. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, the next individual who signed up for public testimony is Mr. Kevin Pranis. Mr. Pranis, welcome back to the committee. Uh, thank you, Chair Long and committee members. Uh, Kevin Pranis, uh, speaking on behalf of Lyuna, Minnesota, North Dakota, which represents uh, more than 12,000 uh, construction laborers, as well as public sector employees and their families uh, across Minnesota and North Dakota, including uh, laborers who work in conventional energy and fuels and laborers who work in clean energy. And I'm speaking uh, today on behalf of of the bill, particularly focused on uh, the certificate of need requirement for uh, large solar and wind facilities. Uh, I can say that, well, as I think was ably explained by Representative Stevenson, the certificate of need requirement is intended to protect ratepayers. Uh, we think it's failing to do so in our experience. Uh, we think that it's there's the obviously there's a difference between a utility project and projects that are done by independent power producers who do it at their own risk. And I think that not only do those projects not create a burden for ratepayers, but we're creating unnecessarily hurdles for economic development. And even uh, we think raising the cost potentially ultimately for ratepayers by making development more difficult. Uh, so our members have participated in the permitting process to support numerous wind and solar projects that have the potential to create high quality jobs for Minnesotans. And we spend quite a bit of time working with the developers to clear regulatory hurdles, including the certificate of need questions. We're concerned if the law isn't reformed that we risk losing hundreds if not thousands of high quality jobs and tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars worth of economic development, particularly in greater Minnesota. We're currently working on cases, just to provide an example, 400 megawatts of wind that potentially means you know, around 400 full-time uh, high-quality jobs in southwest Minnesota. Uh, that project, because of the outdated statutes, uh, the Department of Commerce has determined is not needed, even though I think it's well understood that there is demand nationally and in this region for more wind energy. 
and this would not, you know, there's no requirement this would burden ratepayers. Uh, so that project, if the commission were to follow the department's guidance based on the law, that project would simply never have the opportunity to be built or would have to wait until it can get a power purchase agreement. The problem is that the companies that are looking for power purchase agreements are looking for projects they know are buildable. They're looking for projects that either have their permits in hand or are close to having their permits in hand and can definitely get interconnections, as Mr. Mavis discussed. And so if we create hurdles for those developers to create to bring buildable projects in, those projects can never be considered by utilities because the utilities can't guarantee that those projects will come to fruition. And the result is fewer projects on offer, uh, less competition, ultimately resulting in higher rates for any customers in the market, whether those are corporate customers or whether those are utility customers seeking to buy into those projects. And so we think it's critically important uh, to move this reform. And I think it's important also to remember that those protections are in place. Anything ratepayers pay for is going to be separately approved through the commission, through a certificate of need process, and also through generally a resource acquisition process. And so if it's affecting Minnesota customers, Minnesota customers have recourse. Uh, the concern is for projects that either don't have customers identified yet, uh, which won't get built until they can show a power purchase agreement, or projects that are serving corporate customers. And frankly, we'd love to be an energy exporter rather than lose those jobs to South Dakota or lose those jobs to Iowa. Uh, we very much appreciate your time and the efforts in this bill to accommodate stakeholder concerns. Thank you very much, Mr. France. Uh, Representative Stevenson, did you have any uh, additional comments before we go to member questions? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, I, I have uh, two questions. Um, first is for, for Mr. Mavis. You mentioned that uh, you, your uh, association works across a number of states, and I'm uh, wondering if you can speak to how Minnesota's regulatory environment compares to other states where developers might be looking to develop projects when it comes to renewable energy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's a good question. Mr. Sikolsky can fill in, too. Um, you know, I mean, several states throughout the region don't have these same sort of certificate of need requirements. Um, you have states like Iowa where everything is permitted at the county level. They can get permits processed in six to eight to nine months. Uh, you have states like South Dakota who has uh, a nine month um, permitting timeline where they need to have the, you know, the projects processed through the permitting process, um, you know, within that time frame. So, um, you know, the certificate of need is a long process. It's, you know, 12 months. You have the site permit process, which is about, six months and these things sort of work congruently together but you know we feel that um as you know transmission becomes more of an issue um you know these projects are just not bound by state borders and we've seen a ton of development in north dakota we've seen a ton of development in south dakota and of course we're still developing here in minnesota um, but we feel like these reforms would kind of um bring minnesota a little bit more in line with uh you know the competition level that we're seeing in surrounding states Thank you. Um, and my, my second question is for, for Mr. Prana. So I thought that your, your point was compelling on um, the ability for Minnesota to be able to export uh, our clean energy. I, we have a terrific wind resource. We have a good solar resource. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you can expand on that and talk a little bit about what some of the opportunities are that you're seeing in either the, um, in, you know, having commercial customers or being able to help have uh, Minnesota renewable energy be sold into other states? Uh, so I think there's two paths for that. Obviously, there's uh, significant demand for renewable energy, and that's coming from you know, two major sources, from utilities that provide power to customers. And it's also coming from uh, corporate uh, you know, companies that have an interest. They've made certain commitments, for example, to build out renewable resources. Sometimes those are directly supplying their facilities. Often uh, they're sort of symbolic purchases where they're buying the energy you know, as part of financial instruments, basically. In Minnesota, we have a regulated system where the utility delivers all the power. Uh, but nonetheless, you'll have out-of-state companies that are making these investments. And so we can think of a couple examples. There have been, you know, and roughly speaking, you know, our understanding is half of the market for renewables is corporate, which means that it could be coming from various places, not only from utilities. And the other half is 
utility driven nationally. And so we've seen both cases where, for example, Google uh, was looking for clean energy from Minnesota and procuring it through Excel through one of these projects that, again, had to be in the development phase and close enough to be actionable. So it would make sense for Excel to acquire that. And then uh, separately, uh, projects that are being built, you know, to be cell power specifically, you know, for those uh, corporations. And so these are both very large markets. Uh, we're seeing a huge run up in corporations making commitments and going out and seeking power. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of Midwestern utilities uh, that have followed Excel's lead, Minnesota Power's lead, Great River Energy's lead in uh, making significant moves into renewables. And so uh, we certainly hear all the time about deal flow. And you know, frankly, we have a lot of jobs that we did lose in Minnesota because of lack of transmission. And that has made the development environment complicated. It's meant that projects that looked very promising ended up failing. Some of those, thanks to Great River Energy, have been picked back up because of some innovative ideas that they've done with their peaking plants. But fundamentally, we just can't afford to pass up on projects that are buildable. And so, you know, in order to capture as much as we can at this market. And so uh, that would be the intent here is to capture that. Thank you, Mr. Pranis. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question would be to Mr. Bo. He said in his testimony that this would eliminate the need for conditional use permits by local entities. Is that correct? Mr. Bo? Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Swazinski, um, that's my understanding of the, the proposal that, uh, as it's drafted, although I think people are talking about maybe um, making it a, a changes to that provision rather than uh, so the one that is in the in the statute in the proposal now is to um, exempt uh, you know, um, these uh, 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 generation tie lines from uh, from certificate need where there or from this permitting process where there is uh, voluntary agreements uh, from all the landowners and I'd let uh, Representative, uh, Representative uh, Stevenson or uh, Mavis talk more in detail about that. My understanding is that uh, uh, where there is that level of agreement that they're trying to move away from that second uh, second requirement um, for for a second route and a and a local uh, conditional use permit. Um, but I'd, I'd defer to either uh, uh, Mavis, uh, Peter Mavis, or uh, Representative Stevenson on that. Mr. Mavis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Representative Swazinski, is your, is your question related to the conditional use permit at the local level? Mm -hmm. Looks like yes. Yeah, I can let Mr. Sikolsky fill in, but the, the intent here is that um, these solar plants have very, very small, in many cases, tie lines from the plant to the substation and the, the lines are so small that it falls below the PUC's threshold for, um, for oversight. And so it falls on the local unit of government to have to, to, to permit these very short lines. And my understanding, Mr. Stoltz can fill in, is that, these, that the local units of government are, are kind of uncomfortable with this because they just don't have any experience. The idea is that you would bring these small lines into the permitting process so it's all done within the site permit of the, the solar plant. Mr. Sokolsky, looks like he wanted to chime in. Yeah, Chairman Long, uh, Representative Swazinski, that's exactly it. Um, the idea here is to, if you have a solar plant being permitted by the state PUC, that it would allow for this smaller, it might be a thousand foot transmission line that's 115 kilovolts, for instance, very small, single parcel. It would allow that same short transmission component that's necessary for the project to be permitted with the project application at the PUC, rather than having one permit being issued by the commission and a second smaller permit being issued by the county. It kind of wraps it all up in one package for the public um, so they can come in to say, hey, I'm a, if I have a concern about the line, I'm in the right place. I'm at the, at the state. I can talk about that. If I'm concerned about the solar plant, I can talk about that within this context of this single uh, permitting proceeding. One of the goals of, of where the commission has been over the last 20 years is trying to combine uh, permit proceedings together where you have two different elements to ensure that, you know, a member of the public who has a concern isn't uh, showing up to the wrong meeting to comment on a transmission line or the wrong meeting to uh, comment on, a, on, a, on a, a wind farm permit. So it just tries to consolidate those together. 
Chair. Representative Swazinski, it looks like we have lots of hands, so if we Sorry, can, uh, this is a interesting bill. Um, just a question, where are the county at? So like where would be the, the counties as an association out on this bill? I mean, have you seen, maybe Mr. Sabosky, have you seen, or any of the other developers, have you seen counties using this as a tool to deny development? In Mr. case, Spol you know, obviously they're locally elected officials. Um, you know, we've seen that with the fracking mans and things like that, that locals are able to use some of their small, even though it's small, and maybe they disagree with the, the total project, but trying to use that as leverage to either change the, the project or do that. Uh, you know, I just have a little concern uh, taking away local control. I think under current law, anything over 40 KW, um, I think there's a number in there, automatically goes to the, the PUC and everything under does not. And so that's obviously a concern that we want to maintain as much local control as possible. Mr. Sokolsky. Chair Long, Representative Swazinski. No, I've not seen this being used as a, a, a strategy for counties to oppose. Um, and in fact, I think utility or the independent power producers like my company want to have the best possible relationship with the counties because we will still need road agreements, um, uh, certain uh, uh, types of additional construction permits to be issued by the county. So our, our interest is to stay congruent with the county and, and in a good relationship with them. Um, really what we see this is simply one of these, uh, a way to combine together some permits uh, where we have, I think, some unintended um, situations where uh, the way that the thresholds are set up in statutes, um, some things get, you know, too small for the commission, um, and we just want to include those at the commission permit to, uh, as kind of an associated facility, kind of wrap everything up into a single environmental review public process rather than having kind of two separate uh, processes. And then finally, Mr. Chair, um, and just from a certificate of need standpoint, I'm guessing we don't need this electricity. That's why we would get rid of a certificate of need. Um, and then two, um, looking at if it's an independent producer, would Excel still need to go through the process if they were going to build a project themselves? So, you know, I've heard a lot that uh, community solar and some are actually just displacing industrial uh, placement. I think we've had over 800 megawatts of community solar coming at a very expensive price. And all that really has done is just displaced regulated energy, you know, because that's deregulated because they don't need a certificate need to put those in place. And this would move all independent production. So essentially we would move all of that and put Excel and what they might have planned or what the utilities might have planned out. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Representative Stevenson. Well, I mean, as you point out, uh, the, the community solar is not really analogous. That's, that's a different thing altogether that isn't contemplated by this bill. They already don't need a certificate of need. The idea is if you have the monopoly, if you have uh, rate recovery, you still would need a certificate of need or to go through the, the system. As a practical effect, uh, I think Mr. Pranis noted that uh, most of these development projects would be built uh, for the benefit of a utility who would have a power purchase agreement that would be looked at by the PUC for reasonableness and prudency. Uh, so it would, you would still have that, that recovery. It's, it's just, we don't need, or that review rather, we just don't need a certificate of need when you have a, a developer doing something when they can't pass the buck onto the ratepayer, regardless of whether it makes economic sense. So we have um, three Three hands in two minutes, so we'll try to uh, keep them brief if we can. Uh, Representative Franzen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have a question for Ms. Fuji. Um, is there a surplus or deficit of generating capacity on the grid currently for this year? Ms. Fuji. Uh, Rep Mr. Chair, Representative Franzen, I don't know if there is an, a surplus. Uh, I think each individual utility has control over whether or not it's got a surplus or um, lesser. So like Great River Energy does have excess capacity. Thank you. Uh, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I know we're short on time. So I would just say that to me, this bill restricts or tries to eliminate local control through the counties. We need that two-step process versus a one-step process, which would probably be held at the state level and roll over the local input. You know, I find it interesting 
in an industry with lots of government mandates and lots of gut tax subsidy that we want to try to get rid of any impediment in terms of local input or restrict it uh, as this bill tries to do. You know, this is what tax subsidies do. People forget about the science and they concentrate on this tax subsidies, which has a blinding effect on people's minds in terms of what they're actually doing. No response is necessary. Thanks. Representative Lislegard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mine's just a comment. Um, obviously, this this bill is about um, streamlining the permitting process, uh, following the process, but um, being efficient and effective and not pets and Republicans and all we're going to talk about other organizations and other projects um, trying to not duplicate um, the permitting process and certain organizations using that um, to stop uh, or delay projects uh, um, to a point of potential. That's all. Thank you. Representative Liscard, I think we caught about uh, two thirds of that. You were cutting out a little bit. I don't know if you want to try one it more time. Okay, well, Mr. Chair, it's just it was just a point that you know I totally believe in um, uh, streamlining, e being efficient, effective, not duplicating the work, um, creating opportunity and jobs in a safe and productive manner. I just ask both Democrats and Republicans, we all talk about streamlining and being efficient and effective, that we think about this not only for this project and this opportunity, but all opportunity, whatever industry in the permitting process in an effective way that does not shortcut um, any environmental review process, I think that we all on both sides of the aisle and the organizations that are speaking today Keep that in mind um, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lisselgard. Um, we are over time, but Representative Swazinski, you look like you had a quick question, I hope. Oh, I was just trying to clarify what Lisselgard was saying. I'm sorry. Was he saying that he thinks that we should have the certificate of need eliminated for Excel as well? Or I didn't. No, I don't think so. I, I think he okay. was making a, a general point about um, how uh, looking at our regulatory system could be good for job creation. Uh, Representative Stevenson, would you like to have any closing comments? Well, you know, I, I, this has been a fascinating discussion. I particularly was interested in uh, Representative Grunhagen's comments about tax credits and would encourage him to think hard, long and hard about the tax credits and tax incentives available to the fossil fuel industry and whether they make any sense going forward. Uh, uh, seems uh, like that would be an appropriate uh, review. Maybe something we could work on together, Representative Grunhagen. Uh, I think this is a good uh, uh, bill. I got a lot of great feedback today. We'll continue to work on it to try and make it better, and I thank the committee for its time. Thank you so much, everyone. Sorry for going a couple minutes over. Our next meeting is Tuesday, March 9th at 10.30 a.m. And with that, our meeting is adjourned.